Okay, uh, let us now open our Bible from 2 Samuel chapter 4. 2 Samuel chapter 4, we will be continuing our exposition from the Bible, uh, from the book of 2 Samuel. Uh, we'll take turn by reading these 12 verses of verse 4. 12 verses only, a very short chapter. And we'll be uh, taking turn reading this 12 verses. I will read verse 1, and all of you will read verse 2, and we take turn until verse 12. Okay? Second Samuel chapter 4, I will start verse 1. When Ishbosheth, Saul's son, heard that Abner had died at Hebron, his courage failed, and all Israel was dismayed. The Berothites fled to Gitaim and have been sojourner there to this day. Now the sons of Rimnon, the Berothite, Rechab and Bana, set out, and about the heat uh, the, of the day, they came to the house of Isbosheth, and he was taking his noonday rest. When they came into the house, as he lay on his bed in his bedroom, they struck him and put him to death and beheaded him. They took his head and went by the way of the Arabah all night. But David answered Rechab and Bana, his brother, the sons of Rimnon, the Berothite, as the Lord lives, who has redeemed my life out of every adversity. How much more when wicked men have killed a righteous man in his own house on his bed? Shall I not now require his blood at your hand and destroy you from the earth? Let us pray one more time. Heavenly Father, we ask now that your Holy Spirit be poured into our hearts so and lead us into the truth of you who has been given to us in your Holy Scripture as your Holy Spirit has inspired the prophets and the, uh, the apostles who wrote the Scripture. Let the same Holy Spirit, our Lord, also lead us today, this afternoon, as we listen and ponder upon your word, so that we will hear your voice and we will respond according to what you want us to do. May you bless your servant, a very weak uh, he is, so that uh, he, by your power, will preach your powerful word. May you bless each one of us, O Lord, and guide everyone in this place and in, the, in our own homes that are listening to your word. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, we give thanks and we pray. Amen. 
Okay, brothers and sisters, um, two weeks ago, as if you re still remember, we have talked about Abner, yeah, the alpha male general, who was the real power behind the puppet king Isboshet. If you still remember, the king Isboshet was the the Saul's son, yeah, but uh, the real power behind this puppet king was actually Abner. And two weeks ago, we we uh, we uh, we, he we heard that uh, Abner was killed by Joab as a revenge for his brother who has who was killed by Abner. And our text today is the continuation of the story, like uh, the first one says here: When Isbosheth Saul's son heard that Abner had died at Hebron, his courage failed, and all Israel was dismayed. The, the, his, his Boshet's courage fell, literally, it, it says the, uh, his hands dropped, <sighs> dropped, lost his courage, lost his uh, power, lost his everything. He has no power anymore, and all Israel was dismayed. So in this context, uh, the writer of Second Samuel wrote about our main character here, or the, yeah, the, the the antagonist here, yeah, the main character, Rechab and Banna here. Two captains of Isboshet raiding bands who appeared very courageous when they killed King Isboshet, the enemy of King David. I said this, uh, it, it, it's only appearance. Uh, uh, they only appear courageous because the writer is actually say, saying something else here. He put the Rechab and Banna in the context of total weakness of Saul's house. Not only the writer wrote about Isboshet, Saul's son's uh, lack of courage to continue resistance, he also wrote about Mephibosheth, uh, Jonathan's son, uh, probably the only other heir of Saul, was crippled in his feet. So whatever Rechab and Banna did here, was hardly a heroic and courageous endeavor, but more likely like a high school student who bullies grade one student. Because Saul was, Saul's house was already in total failure, in total weakness. And that's why what they did here. This perspective can also be deduced from the way the writer wrote verse five to seven. Uh, uh, especially uh, if you look at verse seven, it's a, it's a, it's a, repeti uh, it's a repetitious of verse five and six. I invite you to, to read again, to look at again, verse five until seven here. Yeah. Look, look again, verse five is, is, is okay, the introduction. Now the son of Rimnon, the Birohite, Rechab, and Bana set out, and about the heat of the day, they came to the house of his Boshet as he was taking his noonday rest. It's, it's very clear there. Rechab and Bana came at the heat of the day and uh, to the house of his Boshet as his Boshet was t taking his noonday rest. Verse six, and they came into the midst of the house as if to get wheat, and they stab him in the stomach. Yeah, it's also very clear, came into inside um, as if to get the wheat, but they uh, slip into uh, his uh, room, uh, yeah, uh, obviously, and stab him in the stomach. But then the word come again, then Rechab, Bana, his, and Bana, his brother, escape. Verse six, they escape already. But for seven, the writer seems uh, repeating the story. When they came into the house as he lay on his bed in his bedroom. See, it's like repeating again. It's already said before, but it's, he's repeating again. When they came into the house as he lay on his bed in his bedroom, they struck him and put him to death and beheaded him. Verse 6 already said they escaped, but they, here continue, they took his head and went away, and went by the way of the Arabah all night. So, um, yeah, the first, first, the first time I read also is a bit confusing. Why, why the, the writer of Second Samuel uh, should repeat this, uh, the story again? 
uh, in verse 7 especially, not only the writer adds the detail about slicing of Isboshet's head, but repeats the item from verse 5 uh, that he was resting in his bedroom, and verse 6 also. Uh, there's, there's something uh, uh, important here, yeah, and I agree with uh, Dale Davis, the Old Testament scholar, that uh, he said that the repetition is actually deliberate. Yeah. Uh, one can almost hear the writer sneer here, that Rekab and Bana are so macho, they can kill a man in his sleep. Tough hombres indeed. They came, he slept, they step. So we can conclude from the way the writer wrote the story, he was actually mocking and ridiculing Rekab and Banner. The writer will later report uh, David's judgment on their, de on their deed, verse 9 to 11, but he has already given us his own judgment by using sarcasm here. Look at Bana, look at what, he, what they did, and Rekab uh, and Bana, they, they look, they seem very strong, can kill the king and beheaded the king. But what they did actually was not heroic, but is uh, cowardly, because he only killed the king while he was sleeping. Who cannot kill someone well, when he was sleeping? Biblical writers are actually very skillful at using sarcasm. To sh uh, the purpose is to shock God's people into having true perspective on things. Sometimes the sarcasm is overt and blatant, but sometimes it's more subtle. Daniel 3 is a good example of a subtle sarcasm. The narrative tells of Sadrach, Meshach, and Abednego refusal to bow down and worship Nebuchadnezzar's humongous golden image. If you read later, we will see it's about 27 meters high. 20 meters, meters high is about nine stories. Nine stories of our building. One building, one story is about, nine, about three meters. So nine stories of building of the humongous golden image of Nebuchadnezzar. And... Sadrach, Mesach, and Abednego were, were forced, were, were threatened to, to worship, to bow down and worship this, this image, uh, but, uh, and threatened to be thrown into the fiery furnace if they refuse um, uh, to, to worship this, this image. But there's a fascinating undertone in the, in the, in the, the way the writer of Daniel uh, tells this story. Uh, let us open our Bible there from the, uh, Daniel chapter 3. I'll, I'll show you as an example of this sarcasm in the Bible yeah, to, to shock the people, to shock us as we read this. Uh, uh, in this fascinating story, uh, Daniel chapter 3, yeah? Daniel chapter 3. Um, in, in this one chapter... Um, it is, it, is, it, is, it is told nine times that the image uh, of, of uh, the, 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 the humongous image, the very giant and wonderful image, golden image of Nebuchadnezzar, it is actually what Nebuchadnezzar has set up. This is only an image that has been set up by Nebuchadnezzar's hand, by a man's hands. Nine times. Actually, in this one chapter, it is repeated and repeated and repeated again. Yeah, first one. Let, let us see this word. First one. King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold whose height was 60 cubits and so on in the province of Babylon. King Nebuchadnezzar made an image. This is the image that King Nebuchadnezzar made. Yeah, first two. Yeah, first two. Then... King Nebuchadnezzar sent together the satraps, the prefects, and the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, and the justice, the magistrates, and all the officials of the province to come to the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Again, verse 3. Then the satraps, the prefect, and, and so on, magistrate, and all the officials of the province gathered for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. 
and they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up yeah, twice there in the first three. Verse five. Verse five. Then that when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigger, and harp, by, and, and, and every kind of music, you are to fall down and worship the golden image that the king Nebuchadnezzar has set up. Yeah, verse 7, if you look. Therefore, as soon as all the people heard the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music, all the people, nation and language fell down and worshipped the golden image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Verse 12. There are certain Jews whom you have appointed over the affairs of the province Babylon, Sadrach, Mesach, and Abednego. These men, O king, pay no attention to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Verse 14. Verse 14. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said to them, It is true, O Sadrach, Mesach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods and worship the golden image that I have set up. Verse 18. This is the answer of, of Sadrach, Mesach, and Abednego. But if not, maybe we can hear read from verse 16. O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Nine times. This is the image that Nebuchadnezzar has set up. This is, you have set it up. This is, there is nothing real about this massive image. The, the writer is, going, is, is saying to us in a, a very sarcastic way, it is a, a, don't be intimidated into worshipping this Nebuchadnezzar massive image. See for what it is. This is an image that he himself set it up. There is nothing real or defined about it. It is just like a, square, a, a scarecrow in Kakimber Fields, Jeremiah said. So back to 2 Samuel chapter 4, brothers and sisters. The writer is saying here that Rechab and Bana may appear bold and daring. But take another look. They are not strong, but they are actually weak. They are not courageous but cowardly. They are not manly, but mercenary. They come only to sell something. They are not heroic or courageous or anything like that. The whole matter underscores something about ourselves, doesn't it? How urgently we need discernment and how prone we are to lack it. How we must see the real beneath the veneer of the apparent. Especially in the age of post-truth, where hoax and fake news are everywhere. So that we sometimes, very hard to see, to hear, and to know what is really the truth. The most danger of all lies is actually lie under the pretense of religion. And this leads us to our second point, the pretending of Bana, uh, uh, Rekab and Bana here. After beheading Isboshet, Rekab and Bana escaped and went to David's house. And verse 8, they say here, verse 8, uh, Verse 8 says here, and brought the head, they brought the head of Ishbosheth to David at Hebron, and they said to the king, Here is the head of Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, your enemy, who sought your life. The Lord has avenged my lord the king this day on Saul and on his offspring. Uh, 
There's no disputing of the facts. When they said this is Isboshet's head, obviously David know this is Isboshet's head. Yeah. And, and when he said uh, this is uh, Saul's son, yeah, David know uh, Isboshet is Saul, was Saul's son. And who sought David's life? Yeah, and yeah, David know that uh, uh, Saul and all uh, uh, Isboshet also. Uh, were, were seeking uh, to kill David all his life. Now, the, the next sentence, their next sentence is very important. It is, it is not only the fact, but it is their interpretation of what has just happened. They said, the Lord has avenged my Lord, has avenged my Lord the King this day on Saul and on his offspring. This word seems even true and seems right at the, uh, at, the, at the surface. However, if we look at the context, this word uh, was said by Rakab uh, uh, and Banna. Obviously, uh, it, uh, they, they, they are saying this is, this is what we have done. What, this is what we have done. What we have done is uh, through our hands, the Lord has avenged my Lord, the King, this day on Saul and on his offspring. So we, we, then we, we should ask a crucial question here. Was this really the Lord's vengeance upon Saul and his seed? Were Rechab and Banna then, as they were implying here, the servants of the Lord in executing, executing his justice by eliminating David's rival and solidifying David's position. Surely we know the answer from what later uh, will be done to them. We'll see that it, that is not the case. But the important point we learn in the second point is how dangerous it is to use the name of the Lord as Rechab and Bana did while pursuing our own ambition. How dangerous it is to use the name of God to justify what we have done. Rechab and Bana claim they have done what God wanted them to do while the only thing in their mind was to, to advance their political career in David's kingdom. By doing what they have done, they thought David will be in debt to them in solidifying his position and therefore will give them posh government position. Brothers and sisters, we know this kind of mindset is still rampant in the, ch in the church. We still hear many pastors today claiming the Holy Spirit is speaking to me now. Even during this pandemic, we, we heard a pastor said, God told him that no Christian will get this virus. God told him to, to say to this virus, be calm, be silent, as Jesus said to the storm. As wrong as it is, I am more concerned with the danger facing our own church. Because it is more important for us to do self-examinations since we are also not immune with this kind of mindset, of mindset. For example, when we are being rebuked by our friend or by, by your pastor, by, your, 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 by the elders, it is our natural tendency to use theology for our defense. We will say surely that we are all sinners, but God, is, but God is compassionate and loving, certainly more loving and more compassionate than you. And by the way, uh, why don't you, uh, don't you know what Jesus said, that judge not, that you be not judged. We even quote scriptures to justify what we do. So, we must be aware, brothers and sisters, it is, when I say we, is including me, we must be aware. When, when we explain things theologically, we may simply be using God for 
our excuse and quote the Bible for our defense and for our justification. Using the Bible as an argument, manipulating God and His Word for our convenience to keep from submitting to His grace or to His law. C.S. Lewis see this clearly when he says, the sins of the flesh are bad, this, uh, but they are the least bad of all sins. All the worst pleasures are purely spiritual. The sins of the flesh refer to, to sins such as drunken, drunkenness, gambling, stealing, and so on. That's so, something that is very obvious to all of us. But uh, C.S. Lewis said they are, they, are, they are bad. He didn't say it's good, it's okay. He said they are bad, but the, they are the least bad. When he talks about the worst sins, C.S. Lewis mainly talks about pride, something that we cannot see at, at the front on the surface. He says like this, unchastity, anger, greed, drunkenness, and all that, the sin of the flesh, are mere flea bites in comparison. It was true pride that the devil become the devil. Pride leads to every other vice. It is the complete anti-God state of mind. And on other place, he says, that is why a cold, self-righteous prick who goes regularly to church may be far nearer to hell than a prostitute. But he continued, he closed, but of course, it is better to be neither. So it is, it is, it is this kind of sin that is, uh, of course, for us, uh, to, uh, we, are, we are more prone to this. I, I believe uh, none of us are, 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 are murderer, none of us are, uh, are drug addict. Yeah. Maybe, maybe almost uh, no one is, is, a, is, a, is a thief or still something, yeah, maybe not of, of all that, or maybe drunkard, drunkenness, maybe we are not prone to that, but, but pride, um, and using God's name, using the, 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 the clothes of religion to, to cover bad inside, something bad inside, is, it is uh, for us to be, to be warned. Back to 2 Samuel chapter 4, David also see this clearly in, the, in the what uh, Rechab and Banna said. He sees the manipulation, the pride, and the self-ambition of Rechab and Banna when they use the name of God yeah, for their own advantage to gain David's favor. And David did to them what they deserve. And this is certainly also a warning to all of us. The third point, brothers and sisters, the next question is should, we should ask is, uh, how, how do we avoid this dangerous mindset of red cup and banner? Verse 9 actually gives us an answer. One of the answer, one of the important answer here that we can learn from uh, from this chapter. How do you avoid this dangerous kind of mindset? Verse 9, from the word of David, he said here, but David answered Rechab and Banna, his brother, the sons of Rimnon, the Birotite, as the Lord lives, who has redeemed my life out of every adversity. Uh, what, what does it have to do with this? How do, uh, with, with the kind of mind with it, uh, with fighting against uh, this kind of mindset, the rack up mindset? It is the answer is is first nine gives us the answer of a, a gratitude heart, a truly gratitude heart to God, gives an excellent vaccine for pride. Old Testament scholar Fockelman uh, call 
calls uh, attention to the similarity of language and the contrast in meaning between Rekab's and Bana's claim in verse 8 and David's confession in verse 9. If you look at verse 8, Rekab and Bana said, Saul, your enemy, David, David's enemy, your enemy who sought your life. But verse 9, David said, The Lord who has redeemed my life out of every adversity. Rekab and Bana say, Saul, your enemy, who sought your life? But David said, it is, it is only the Lord who has redeemed my life out of every adversity. He is emphatically saying, uh, 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 Fogelman says that the correspondence is a subtle hint that the gentlemen, Rekab and Bana, do not need to excite themselves about the enemies of David out for his blood because David is already under the protection of the Lord and does not need any henchmen. To be fair, Rechab and Bana are not claiming to be God. They are only saying that by their deed, they have decisively eliminated the whole threat against David from Saul's house. They dare not claim too much, but they want to put a certain spin on their treachery to suggest that David is indebted, indebted to them for this finishing touch that makes his kingdom secure. However, David was not trapped with this kind of suggestion because he knew that he had only one true redeemer. As the Lord lives, who has redeemed me, who has redeemed my life out of every adversity. What gratitude breathes in those words. And because David remembers how God rescues him from every one of his troubles. He is not tempted to praise and give credit to this evil man for the deliverance of a gracious God. But we must guard against a possible misunderstanding here as I ponder upon, upon this truth. There's a possible of misunderstanding here. Um, we must guard against it. If, 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 Re, uh, the, uh, if, if Rekab and, and Bana, if, yeah, only if Rekab and Bana had a right motivation to support David and did the right thing to implement this support is in supporting David, it is actually true. It is actually right. It was not wrong, even appropriate, if they did that, for David to praise and give thanks to them for that. In other words, uh, it is not wrong for us to be happy when someone praises us for the good and right things we have done. Again, C.S. Lewis gives um, this clarification in his uh, uh, book, Mere Christianity. He said like this, he gives an, uh, an example. A child who is patted on the back for doing a lesson well, a woman whose beauty is praised by her lover, the safe soul to whom Christ says, well done, are pleased and ought to be. In other words, if we are pleased and ought to be, and, and we should be pleased if, 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 if Jesus said uh, to us, well done, we should dream of that. We should want to be, uh, for, for Jesus to say that to us, well done. We want to be, to be uh, elated and happy and joyful and looking for that word of, of Jesus saying good things for us. It is not wrong for us to be, to be joyful and thankful and to be, uh, to be joyful and uh, to be pleased uh, if, uh, if we experience that. I give you, uh, I'm thinking, as I think about this word of C.S. Lewis, I, I was uh, reminded of the, uh, the book from uh, Proverbs chapter 31. Yeah, that's the, the husband uh, uh, says about his wife. Yeah, it's a uh, very famous words from uh, 
Proverbs chapter 31. I quote a few verses there, there when the husband says about his wife, an excellent wife, who can find? She is far more precious than jewels. If you, the girl, the wives, uh, receive these words from your husband, well, how, how, how would you feel? And, and he continues, many women have done excellently, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. The husband is praising him, praising her, praising uh, his wife. Yeah, many women have done excellently, but you surpass them all. How would you feel as, as a woman, as a wife, if your husband says that things? It is, it is, my point is, is here is it is right for the husband to praise his wife, and it is right also for the wife to feel joyful, to feel pleased, to feel elated by these praising words to her. But trouble begins when you pass from thinking, I am pleased to have done my best and please God or please other people, to serve other people. I am pleased to have done that into thinking, what a fine person I must be to have done that. And I deserve to get what I really want by doing that. The former way of thinking is actually quite biblical to, to do and to, to want uh, uh, God's blessing, to want uh, to please God, and then we become pleased as we do uh, good things for God, as we do good things as, uh, to other people, and we are pleased because of that. That is a biblical way of thinking. But the latter, when we think, when we start to think what a fine person I must be to have done it and I deserve to get what I really want from what I have done, the latter is, is uh, the way Recap and Banner think. In short, the, the one, the first one is, uh, is other or God-centered way of thinking. It's God-centered and other-centered. It's for God and for others, for the good of others. And we will be pleased by doing that. We will be joyful by doing that. But the latter, recap and banner thinking, is a self-centered way of thinking. And the vaccine of this latter kind of thinking is to realize that everything good ultimately comes from God. And therefore, we will have a humble and gratitude in our hearts. As Psalm 103, verse 2 to 5 says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagle. It is good, it is right for us to, uh, to, to, have, uh, to, uh, to, to be crowned with the, the steadfast love and mercy of God. It is good for us to, to want that. It is good for us to, 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 to be one, to be satisfied with the goodness of God. It is good. And it is right. And, and by receiving that, we, we, we have a grateful heart and we, we give praise to God as we experience His goodness in our lives. But it's not, that is not the, the kind of thinking of Rechab and Banner. Gratitude has always proven the, the safeguard for all Christ's flock. Maybe some of you have heard about the, the story of Polycarp in uh, around 155 AD. Uh, Polycarp of Smyrna was captured uh, by the authorities and required to call Caesar Lord or be burned or be thrown to wild peace. Polycarp refused. The church father Polycarp refused. 
and the authority assured him that he had wild beasts and would feed Polycarp to them if he refused. Polycarp replied, send for, send for them. And the uh, council, the authority said, if you despise the wild beasts, I will send you to the fire, threatened the council. I will send you to the fire, swear, and I will release you. Curse the Christ. Polycarp then replied with these very famous words. Eighty and six years have I served Christ, and he has done me no wrong. How then can I blaspheme my king who has saved my life? Eighty and six years I have served Christ, and he has done me no wrong. How then, I can, how, can, how then can I blaspheme my king who has saved me? The words are different with what David said here, but the principle is the same. Gratitude is the vaccine of self-centered, self-reliant mindset. Gratitude help us to obey and submit to God in the face of trials and temptation. That is the, the key and the, I think one, one of the important um, key for us to, to be not fall into the, the kind of mindset of uh, recap and banner. And lastly, last point is uh, we will see what happened to Banner and, and uh, 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 Recap is become a, a warning for those who, who has this kind of mindset and also an encouragement uh, for God's people who follow God because we will see the, the justice of God is delivered in, in the first 9 to 12, especially first 10 to 12. Let us see again. Let us come back to Second Samuel chapter 4. Uh, after giving a firm statement that only the Lord who has redeemed his life, verse 9, David told Rechab and Banner what had happened to the person who thought he was bringing good news when he killed Saul. Verse 10. Uh, David said here, uh, when one told me, behold, Saul is dead, and thought he was bringing good news. You remember the Amalekite, that this one, yeah, few, uh, chap the chapter before. I seized him, David said, and killed him at Ziklag, which was the reward I gave him for his news. I think stop from, uh, from that point, Rekab and Bana must have started to have cold sweat listening to the words of David here. And they, then they understand why when David continues his argument in verse 11. Yeah. Verse 11, how much more when wicked men have killed a righteous man in his own house on his bed, shall I not require his blood at your hand and destroy you from the earth. David gives the order and they are killed and their hands or feet are cut off and their handless and feetless corpse are then hanged on the wall as public disgrace. This is to show how outraged the king was and as a way to say to the people that, that these fellows will never sneak again and never step again. Their feet and their hand were cut off. This is obviously a great warning um, to all of us, to those who, who thought they can manipulate and use God's name for their own unholy ambition. But it is also a great encouragement for the people of God 
for Yahweh's chosen king, David, just redress the wrong. And for us today, we can understand what David did as a sign of something greater, something much greater. Every bit of micro-justice enacted under David's regime here should be understood as a foreshadow of the macro-justice that David's promised descendant will enforce throughout the earth in his own time. Isaiah 11, verse 1 to 5 says, this is also in the quotation in the context of our coming Christmas, um, the, the, the arrival of Messiah says here, Isaiah 11, verse 1 to 5, I read it for you. There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, and his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what his eyes see or decide disputes by what his ears hear. But with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips. He shall kill the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt on, of his ways and faithfulness the belt of his loins. Similar to this, Isaiah, Isaiah 9, verse 5 to 6 says, For unto us a child is born, for us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it, with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. You see here that justice and righteousness have been established in Jesus' first coming, especially in the death of Christ, which Paul said it was to show God's righteousness or God's justice at the, at the present time, so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. And justice and righteousness will be made perfect when Jesus will come again for the second time, as Jesus himself said in John 5, verse 25, 29. Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. And he has given him authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out those who have done good to the righteousness of life and those who have done evil to the, righteous, to the resurrection of judgment. So, brothers and sisters, let us be encouraged with these words of God which will never fail. And let us spread this good news of the sure judgment of God so that people would believe in Christ who has borne the righteous judgment of God so that we will be called righteousness of God in Christ when we believe in Christ. And let us do this. Let us spread this good news especially during this Christmas time where it is good 
time for us to invite our friends, our colleagues, our neighbors, our families to our Christmas under one roof. So they will not be judged in themselves by the righteous judgment of God, but they and we will be just only in Christ who has borne the judgment of God so that we will be declared righteous in Christ. Let us pray together. <clears throat> Let us stand together and sing a song, I Surrender All. I surrender all, I surrender all, all to Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for this afternoon. We give you thanks for the word of God that has been given to us. Thank you for your truth. Thank you for your rebuke and your reminder of us about your word, about your, the, your righteous judgment and how we should live uh, truly uh, with a grateful heart to, so that we will avoid the mindset of Recap and Banner, who try to manipulate and use your name for our own advantage, our own gain. May we pursue the true gain that you have shown us in Christ, in your way, in your truth, and in yourself. Help us to follow and obey your word and your truth so that we will receive the joy and the abundance of life that is only found in you. May you bless and guide each one of us, O oh Lord. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, we give thanks and we pray. Amen.